So here's my first tool use. Um, and as I said in the section where I showed, showed you my tools, um, the flat wooden tools, uh, or rather this one has a curved um, end to it. But these are the first ones I, I use after the initial stage where I use only my hands. It's because I want to do everything as gesturally and loosely as I can at first. Now, now I am using the rake tools uh, to just even some areas out. Uh, I think a, a flared nostril is a very important part of the character, so I'm putting that in uh, now. And uh, I'm also hollowing out the corners of the eyes. How the eyeball sits within the skull is an incredibly important thing to observe and get right in your sculpture, because the cliché is, I think, true where the eyes are the soul of the character unless your character doesn't have eyes Um, that uh, that large wide loop is is very useful in um, cleaning areas up. My basic form is more or less established at this point. Um, not finished, uh, but more or less seventy five percent there, um, and. I'm using this tool now to help me just clean up uh, wide areas and get them smoother so I can start concentrating on uh, on the next few steps. One other uh, method that I work with is um, adding pellets of clay and smoothing, smearing them on, uh, like what I just did with the nasolabial folds, or, or the cheeks, rather. That, that does produce very nice organic um, forms. Uh, here I'm trying to establish the uh, those two knuckles you get at the bottom of your skull which meet your vertebral column. Um, th they are very characteristic skull shapes and uh, because I want this character to just look very bony and uh, emaciated uh, those two bumps are, are very characteristic.
here I'm starting to use my wooden tool to help me deepen out uh, the hollows in the pit of the neck. Uh, these right here are the hollows formed by um, the trapezius muscle. The thing about nature I, I, I find is that it's never quite what you think it is. And it does require a lot of observation to um, pick up on the surprises that nature has to, has to offer. So um, anytime you're out, you're out in public and you, and like, like if you're in the supermarket or you're on a bus or something, uh, just look at all the people around and just take notes of, of anything uh, you find interesting. Uh, store it in your memory bank and um, sooner or later it, it will come through. It will be of use when you um, when, when you when you're working. I think the ears on this character are a little bit of a deviation from the drawing, um, and, and that's like with or without the earlobes. The uh, the ones I did in the drawing are more of like a cup sort of C shape, uh, but I've given this character almost more alert, um, sort of more, uh, I, I guess, fox-like ears. That wooden tool I use to, on the one hand, to scrape things away, and with, on the other hand, to um, blend bits together using the the curved uh, side. And the rake tool here is just useful again in just cleaning areas up, getting them giving them an, an even surface. I, I find it again like sort of a balance between using these rake tools which are very handy for cleaning things up and leaving areas as uh, clay that I've smeared on with my fingers. Um, the clay that I've smeared on with my fingers just inherently has more uh, life to it but the rake tool cleans things up and gives them a more professional look. Um, I mean, once you clean up the rake marks themselves, uh, you get a more even surface, which is, just from a craftsmanship point of view, uh, uh, just a lot cleaner. But if I find that if you do too much of that, you can kill something. So... I mean, I I suppose this is all somewhat abstract to talk about, but for me it is just finding a balance between how much to, of one thing or another to do, uh, which I'm still trying to uh, figure out. 
the nice thing about the artist that I mentioned, uh, Rembrandt Bugatti, was that his work as pure sculpture didn't have to worry about such things. Uh, his work was... It didn't have to uh, be cleaned up and finished to look like a photorealistic thing. So he could get away with leaving the work slightly rough. In fact, that was the point of it. And I suppose you could say that as somebody who works in the movies, uh, the whole point of what I do is just to make things look like perfectly real skin texture. And that is the point of it, but... I suppose the the artist in me still wants to um, still wants to get a nice piece that that pleases my eye as, as a as a sculptor as a as an artist as well as a a technician. Now I'm addressing the forms of the neck, the sternomastoid muscles, uh, which for me is actually kind of hard to figure out on this thing because it's got this curved neck, which isn't a human neck. Um, so how exactly does does that muscle work? It, it's it's a it's not a vulture neck and it's not a human neck, something between the two. So now I gotta find something that um, sits halfway between the two but still works. Uh, now I'm deepening the uh, pit of the neck where the sternomastoid muscles come and meet the uh, fronts of the clavicles. There's that hollow in the pit in the uh, front of the neck. By the way, speaking of looking at things holistically, uh, you'll notice that throughout this uh, demo, I sometimes have my glasses on and I sometimes don't. Part of the reason for that is that uh, being nearsighted, without my glasses, an object doesn't have to be too far away before it starts getting slightly blurry, which I actually use to my advantage because that forces me to look at the form as a whole rather than being distracted by the um the bits and pieces i mean it's it, it it helps me see the forest for the trees and i just find that really helps me a lot uh, I'll, I'll put my glasses on later when it comes to doing things like details and i do put my glasses on uh periodically to step back and look at it and see things as 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 they're meant to be seen if i can get things to hold up uh, to my eye, uh, without my glasses, then, then I, I feel that, that, that means, that indicates that it's on the right track. And here I am just going back into the shape of the skull and putting as much nuance and turn and shifts in the form, uh, shifts in the planes of the skull uh, as, as is natural.
Now here's something I'm doing that's a slight deviation from my drawing. I'm I'm upturning the inner corners of those uh, eyebrows. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is I'm trying to do something atypical uh, as a as a monster design. Um, it's of course very um, it's a very well known cliche for monsters to have 45 degree angry eyebrows. I I think that's actually something a lot of people are trying to avoid these days. But so much to the point where it's almost doing something different if you do put that in now but but for this piece I, I don't think that's really the point I don't want it to have um, uh, the sort of typical evil eyebrows so I, I've given it a slight upward turn in the middle which which actually helps a lot it's um something about that somewhat reminds me of um, a lot of Renaissance artwork, uh, like a lot of characters Michelangelo drew, had that uh, upturned eyebrow. And that sort of ties in with the whole feeling of this being like traditional Greek mythology, somehow. Uh, because a lot of that mythology was depicted in, in Renaissance art. So it helps to give the slightly classical feeling. The things that are not very classical are is the general, you know, extreme caricature of, of the general shapes of the head. But then I'm offsetting that by introducing these very um, almost Renaissance-like forms, like like what I've done with the eyebrow. Um, the shape of the mouth also is like a like a very like a slightly cartoonish version of um, of the kinds of face you would see as gargoyles on churches or um, or in some of um, Michelangelo's drawings of tortured souls. Uh, one piece I have in mind uh, as I'm sculpting is the sculpture of Count Ugolino and his sons by Carpo. If you're familiar with that sculpture, the figure of Count Ugolino has a similar anguished face to the harpy I'm sculpting today. But I'm repackaging it with this sort of um, extremified modern monster design stuff to create something that hopefully is unconventional. Again, you can see me really noodling with that skull again. I mean, you just never know when you're done. You could spend a long, long time just getting the, um, getting all the nuance you, you like into a shape like the skull. Now I'm starting to roughen the hair. I've I, I decided I've done just about enough with the skull to basically have something 
close to done and now I can start doing things such as the hair which um, I'm treating as as a form in itself as well as a, a very important design element it, it defines the overall silhouette of the head and so at this point right now is as crucial to the uh, overall sculpture as anything uh, it wasn't when I was trying to establish the um, the anatomy of the skull and musculature now I can finally start having some fun with the hair. Again, it's really important to take account of how the hair looks like from every angle. Not just the front and not just the side, but how does it look from the back and from the back three quarters. Now I'm starting to do some more detailing uh, with that uh, loop tool with the pointed end. And you can see me there adjusting the tilt of the head very subtly, uh, which, which really does, it, it can make a huge difference. And I'm adding pellets of clay here for the brow. Another thing about the brow is 
a lot of times I've a lot of sculptures you see out there of um, creatures that people do have these very basic sort of um, brows that just look like shelves above the eyes. Uh, and some people definitely do have eyebrows like that, but uh, one thing I find very um, effective, uh, something I like to do, is making subtle um, brow shapes. So if you really observe what the orbital ridge looks like and how the muscle sits on top of that, and you observe how uh, in the center of your forehead you have these big knuckles, or, or, or rather, uh, knuckles that can be either very smooth, so they're hardly there, or, or very pronounced. It's a nice thing to do to just bring a slight bit of nuance and complexity to that area. But, but then again, keeping it very understated to, um, so as things don't get too busy. Uh, this loop tool helps me to clean up uh, a lot of the rake marks. And it does essentially what the rake tools do, in a, but in a much softer, um, smoother way. The notches in the rake marks are uh, useful for aggressively getting uh, clay smooth. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a, um, a handheld torch. It melts the surface of the clay just slightly. I mean, it's important to move around the sculpture quickly when you're doing this so you don't melt any area too much. Uh, obviously, um, when using a torch, it, obviously you, you have to be very careful. And once that clay cools down from the torch, then you can work back into it without sticking your tool into a big melty puddle. I'm very roughly um, applying little pellets of clay uh, to suggest the feathers of, of the uh, head. You'll, no you'll notice that I really do jump around a lot. Like um, between doing the two sides of the head, I've gone and um, fixed up the jaw a little bit. I'm just constantly moving around. I constantly rotate the sculpture. I constantly jump from one area to another as I see fit, just to make sure that the whole thing is being addressed and never one part too much. Uh, that doesn't come until later on when I'm doing the texturing or, or the detailing um, and then the texturing.
Now I'm using that pointed loop tool to start putting in some some very important character lines, which I'm using the torch to soften. The way I build the wrinkles on the forehead is I I first carve the direction of the major lines and then I heat it over with a torch to melt them and soften them and now that the clay has um, cooled down somewhat I'm going in there with pellets of um, of plastiline and smoothing them smoothing them down uh, and, and this is a good way of making nice subtle um, wrinkles. As I said, I really do skip around. Um, so, one thing that's uh, a very easily overlooked um, aspect of sculpting is that every part should be well crafted. So, even the back, where nothing at all is happening, I'm trying to clean up to make a neat sculpture. Now I've just decided that I could add a little bit of nuance there in the temples with the um uh, with the temporalis muscle that um that sits in there. One way to know where to put complexity where needed is to just observe whatever uh, creature's anatomy um where there really are secondary forms that you can play with. Uh, now I'm addressing the forms of the ear, and that's a combination of carving away and adding little pellets where 
uh, the ridges of the inner ears sit. Ears are really tricky. But they can be a lot of fun, too. Uh, because they are such complex forms, it, it really does pay to spend a lot of time on them. Okay, well, here we go. I'm, I'm finally getting rid of those um, ridiculous pendulous earlobes that I thought I wanted before. And at first I'm thinking is, maybe, what if I blend those earlobes into the neck? So they're like the lobes are running down into the neck and forming like kind of a flap uh, on the edges. Maybe that would be interesting. Or perhaps it just becomes anatomically confusing and I may have to get rid of it later on. I'm bringing back the uh, the the rake tool that has a fine tooth to it, uh, and this I'm using to clean up the areas because at this stage, the sculpture has a lot of unevenness in it. But at the same time, while I'm cleaning it up, I'm adding a more smeared pellets of clay here and there, uh, where it's appropriate. Um, again, it, it's a fine balance between doing a nice professional cleaned up sculpture but then doing something that has that undulating surface of a real um, organic creature with it's made of flesh and bone And, and even at this stage, I'm going back and just putting as much nuance into the changes in planes. Here I'm, I'm working on the ear. At, and, and at this stage, the eyes are still very crude. Um, they are just stand-in placeholders. Uh, I'll, I'll do a, more, a better looking job of them later on. For, for delicate forms like the insides of the ears, um, adding little pellets like that is a very nice way to get an organic shape. Now here I am drawing in the lines of the hair uh, so that the flow of the hair will rhyme with the overall uh, gestures of the form. Putting those little pellets on wherever I, I think uh, they'll work.